Hello students, and so keep going. You've got some major projects you're turning in over weeks, your analytic report and your presentation. And we also have this piece, week 13, which is you submitting your resume and cover letter. This is probably my favorite chapter to lecture on because I think this has got some really useful stuff that will help you advance your career, which is really at the heart of what we're trying to do here with getting an education, college education, right? So looking back at my own experience, when I worked at PECO and I was hiring a lot of people for the regional marketing department, I have looked at a lot of resumes and I've interviewed a fair amount of people. And there's definitely some things you can do to stand out from the herd, if you will. And that's what I want to focus on. So the lecture slides, the content, it's going to have some academic stuff that you need for your quizzes. And I'm going to be adding in some more street savvy stuff from my own experience of looking at thousands of resumes. So before we dive into resumes and application messages, which is really a cover letter, we want to remember this. Nothing happens until you get to the interview. So you have to get to the interview to get the job. And if you get to the interview stage, they're down to a very short list of people and you should definitely adopt the mentality that this job is mine. And I'm going to talk about some things you can do to prepare for that. The next chapter, chapter 14, is about interviewing. So when we look at these resumes and the application message, we have to get to the interview. So I think what a lot of us do is we follow the format that we see out there in the online world. We pick a resume template and we input our stuff. We find a application message template and we send it off to the employer. And we're kind of doing this shotgun approach of quantity of sending our stuff out. But you probably won't get a lot of traction with actual interviews. What's going to get the interview is if you spend a lot of time submitting a resume and cover letter for one employer. And you really put a lot of time investing in finding out about the company, what the position is, tailoring your resume, not having a standard resume that you send to every single employer, but tailoring your resume for that job. And then doing something with a little risk in it to get attention and so you can get to the interview. And I'll talk about some tactics on that. So we have to get to the interview. When we're submitting our resume and cover letter, we want to make sure that we're not getting screened out, meaning whoever's looking at these pile of resumes, and they usually have hundreds, is going to thin the herd and get down to their what they think is their short list of their best possible applicants. You want to make it to that list. You don't want to get screened out. What gets you screened out are red flags on your resume. Red flags can include a couple of common culprits that you want to avoid. Number one, job gaps, meaning there is a space of time in your resume where you weren't employed and weren't doing anything else. Those are a red flag. I'll talk later on how you can minimize those in your resume. Short stints on your resume would be another red flag. You had six months at SeaWorld and four months at Sioux Plantation and 10 months over here at In-N-Out Burger. You, when, when they see short stints, the concern is that you have some type of employment problem or you have some issues when you're at your employer as far as being able to stay in the job. Job gaps, short stints, and another gap would be, another red flag would be inconsistent career path where your career is bouncing all over from, first I was a sound technician assistant for, name your favorite band, Soundgarden. And then I um, worked as a sous chef in a restaurant in the gas lamp district of San Diego. And then I was um, an assistant captain for uh, deep sea fishing charters that left San Diego. And then I worked as a front desk clerk at the Hyatt. And what they're seeing is you're bouncing all over the place and don't seem to have a career path of 
your desired industry and occupation. So those are definitely three red flags. There's other things that they might screen you out on, even though they shouldn't. Things like where they might discriminate against you and they, it's not legal, but if an employer is like, you know, we're all liberals here in our company and we prefer to hire somebody who's liberal. Well, they certainly can't screen you out for that if you are a staunch Republican. But the challenge is, how would you know as an applicant? So whoever's looking at those resumes might screen that person out and put them in the circular file. Is that legal? It is absolutely not legal. The reason I bring this up is because you want to be careful what you do and do not put on your resume as far as extra stuff. Like I was the president of the uh, Student Republican Club for Cal State San Marcos. Be careful about putting that information in unless you know enough about the employer that it's not going to be something that might get you screened out. So you want to be careful about that. Okay, so that's a little bit of uh, uh, some, some cautionary tales about uh, resumes. So that's from the standpoint of when I was looking at people and looking to hire them and review their resumes. And then I'm also going to talk about some of the tactics I did early in my career uh, to actually get to the interview stage. Here's your learning outcomes for chapter 13. You want to be able to self-assess and know what your skills are and put that into a resume, which is item two. And item two, also be able to format that resume for the different channels by which employers are going to want them. Some want hard copies, some want them electronic, some have a, a pre-filled thing that you have to fill out online. And then item three, and what I consider kind of the most important, is that, that what I call a cover letter, even if you send it as a, a memo, but it's the message that introduces your resume and how you can write a uh, cover letter message that not only introduces your resume, but gets the attention of the employer and what is the next most important step that we have to get as we're pushing all this paper out to various people? We have to get an interview. We have to get the interview. We got to get to the interview stage. So we want to keep that in mind. And to do that, in some respects, we have to stand out and maybe do things a little bit differently. Your key terms, make sure you have ticked these off. If I don't cover them in the lecture, you can always look them up in the. OK. So let's actually get to a resume sample. What do we like about this resume? We like that it is very well formatted. We see a lot of white space and it's not all crammed together. So white space is important with the resume. We see a summary, which is basically like a highlight of the skills and, and objective of the applicant. So that's kind of your little mission statement, if you will. We see highlights of key skills. And then we see the person's experience of uh, current employment going backwards. And we don't see any red flags, job gaps, short stints. Uh, she was at Samuel's Construction for three years and New Cityland uh, Sentinel for uh, quite a while. So six years there. So no job gaps. And we don't see anything that would screen this person out, Madison, as far as spelling errors or having the company name wrong. Any errors, any punctuation spelling errors are going to get you scanned out and into the trash can. So when we think about the process of applying for a job, I always say, what's the best time to update your resume? As soon as you get a new job. As soon as you get a new job, update that resume. Always have your resume current. And always keep a file handy where you're adding in things with your current employer that you can add to your resume later. You don't want to write your resume after you've left the company and you're trying to recall your accomplishments. Have a file, your name, a file of you, where you're putting your accomplishments in a folder and it helps you not only do your performance review at the end of the year, but also helps build your resume on key accomplishments that you've done at the company. So we see the five steps here for applying for a job and applying for a job is a job into itself. So 
I always used a large spreadsheet where I kept track of every company that I uh, was sending my resume out to, when I sent it out to, if I got a response, who the contact was, and I just got this massive spreadsheet that kind of kept track of my progress and eventually led to a job. So, but in the first step, you are uh, conducting really self-analysis. And you'll see in the week 13 resource page on Canvas that I've also included some links to some personality assessment surveys that you can complete. These are optional, it's not required for anything this week, but it's very important that you kind of know before you start going down the path of a career, is this a good career for me? Am I even a fit based on my skills and my aptitudes and my passions? We can't all do ex we can't all be professional ballet dancers and maybe that's your passion. So we have to live in the real world and we have to find a job so we can take care of ourselves. But we want to try and it may not be exactly the kind of career that we wanted, but we want to try to get as close as possible. If you're a terrible writer, you probably don't want to start your own blog. So we have to assess our strengths and also our personality types and find a job that gets as close to that as possible. So that's what step one is about, researching yourself and also the types of careers that might be applicable for you. So there's lots of online resources, uh, career journals that you can look at for various careers. Occupational Handbook is one excellent resource that lists all the different occupations, the kind of training that you need and what they pay. So occupational handbook. Step two is find an actual job. So we'll get into this more detail with subsequent slides. I think the best way to find a job is to have somebody who's already in that place of employment. It's very tough coming from the outside and getting into a company. What's really going to help your credibility is if you know somebody at the company. Now, we don't all have the luxury of having that, but somebody who hand carries your resume to the potential uh, the hiring person, and they say, you should hire this person. Madison's a great person. You should hire her. She's excellent. Well, that's going to get you probably an interview. You've got an internal recommendation. So trying to find somebody in the company or intern at the company. I'm already interning there and working for free and they see how good you are and how hard you work, you're inside the company. You're a known quantity. That's probably going to help get you an interview. And if you can't do it that way, then maybe you're joining the associations and clubs and professional organizations or the following the LinkedIn um, accounts and pages that follow that industry. And you want to start like working in the industry and contributing in the industry already, even if you don't have a job in there yet. So become a player in that industry and it will lead to a job. So step three is actually preparing your targeted resume. Targeted means you're writing it specifically for that job. I can't tell you as somebody who looked at a lot of resumes, how many people just have a standard resume and they send it out to everybody. You should tailor your resume for the specific job that you're going after. It doesn't mean you lie or put in fictitious information, but you want to put your resume in the best possible light. I'll give you a simple example. When I was uh, hiring for the regional marketing department at Petco, and I was hiring all these marketing coordinators across the U.S., and these people need to have a certain level of retail experience and maybe some uh, multi-unit, meaning several locations experience, either as management or in marketing. But the job I was after was a regional marketing coordinator position. And I would get countless resumes that would say something to the effect of looking for a rewarding career in retail management. I'm like, that's a man management is different. That's not a marketing job. And I was always um, offended, I guess, by people who couldn't take the time to go into the resume and change the word management to marketing. And I did not call them in for an interview. So that's a simple tailor. Sometimes you might want to include information. When I got the job at Jack in the Box, by then I had many years of uh, marketing management experience, and I was coming in at a, a kind of a mid-level marketing manager position. And back when I was attending college uh, and before college, I actually had seven years of restaurant experience managing soup plantation restaurants was one of the first jobs I had as a dishwasher when I was 15 years old. 
but I had restaurant experience. I put that information back in my resume just to show Jack in the Box that I'm not just a marketing person. I actually understand how restaurant operations work. And someone who can get it, get into a restaurant and be comfortable with that fast-paced, moving, hot environment. I got an interview. I got the job. And I believe that information did help. So tailor your resume. Step four, uh, nowadays there's going to be additional things with your resume. Maybe there's a video of yourself or a portfolio. So we'll talk more about that. And then step five is actually get the interview. Get the interview with the company. And at that point, it's game on. You're going to level two uh, when it's time for the interview because they have a short list and you want to be the one that they hire. They're going to hire somebody. Why not you? Why not you? And as I ask you that question, why shouldn't they hire you? You're going to internally be coming up with some internal reasons, some limiting beliefs about yourself. Now, some of these reasons that you're coming up with might be accurate. I don't have the experience that they're after. I don't have the education that they're after. Well, if those are your answers, then go get that. That's easy to solve. But if the other internal answers, limiting beliefs, are more along the lines of, I'm too young, or I don't, I don't, I don't know if I have, I, I don't know if I could do it. Um, I feel a little insecure about it. Or, um, you know, they may, maybe they, maybe they want somebody who, who's a better speaker or a better writer, or you know, kind of these limiting beliefs that you have. Let those go. They're going to hire somebody. Why not you? So get in, get the interview. And then you get the job and you'll figure it out. So we have to get out of our comfort zone to be willing to advance our career. I can't stress that enough. You have to be willing to step up to the next level, get out of your comfort zone to advance your career. All right, so let's get into the nitty gritty of all this. Okay, so step one of the job application process is get info about yourself, the company you want to work for, and the third bullet point there, have a boiled down kind of unique selling point statement about who you are as a employee. I put on this week's module, week 12, the resource page, some links to free assessment sites. So there's the uh, Kiersey Temperament, there's the Myers-Briggs MBTI, Myers-Briggs Type Indicator. These are free surveys where you can do these assessments to kind of see what's a fit for me as far as a career. Uh, we also have the MiraCosta Career Center, so please check that out. They have some career aptitude assessments as well. So learn what, learn what works for you as far as employment with your self-assessment, and then start finding companies that will fit and provide jobs in, that fit your certain aptitudes. So it's so important that you get information about the company. So important. You can look up their annual report. There's a common question that is asked in many interviews that is something along the lines of, tell me why you want to work here. When I was hiring people at Petco, I would often get the answer, because I love pets. I love them so much. Great. What else do you have? Why else do you want to work here? The question asked of why do you want to work here is really an opportunity for you as an interviewer, to, as an interviewee, to feature how much you know about the company and be able to talk about their current operations and what excites you about, oh, you're growing in the East Coast with your small store format. Um, I visited your stores and I think you could improve the signage a little bit around your grooming areas, something along those lines. So tell me what you know about the company and how can you contribute towards the company? So tell me why you want to work here is the golden question for you to feature what you know about the company and also how you can contribute. And to do that, you need to research the company, its competitors, its locations, and have a lot of information about that company. Okay, so you've gathered your essential information. Let's go on to the next step. This slide highlights some sources for career opportunities. Step two, identify those career opportunities. Where are the jobs that fit my skills and aptitudes? I highlighted a couple here under the traditional column. I think the best way is to have a contact within the company who can hand carry your resume to the hiring person 
which will most likely guarantee you an interview if they say this person is great you should bring them in for an interview we don't all have somebody who's already inside the company but another way that we can get inside get our foot in the door is to internship at that company be willing to work for free the internships that i had led to my jobs and my early jobs and my career so be willing to work for free and find a way to sacrifice your schedule and make room for that internship to get in the door those are probably the two best you could also be a part of the professional trade organizations uh, that the company is involved in so if it's retail there's going to be things like uh, um, chain store magazine and if it's uh, in my case it was in restaurants so there's uh, nation's restaurant news which is their publications but there's always an association and an organization professional organization that's tied to the industry that you want to work in so be a member and maybe even get involved and volunteer for that organization you want to start working in the industry that you want to work in even if you don't have a job in there yet I can't stress that enough so those are good and there's some other examples here uh, electronic and subscribing to news groups certainly LinkedIn is a source where you can do that so uh, find where the jobs are another source is you can go into these directories um, the San Diego Business Journal which is a, a business periodical puts out an annual what they call book of lists and it shows here's all the companies in San Diego by their industry how many people they employ employ and here's the contacts the key contact people uh, in all the different departments it's a wonderful source of information San Diego Business Journal their annual book of lists and of course we want to go online so there's popular websites listed on this slide LinkedIn is obviously a power horse make sure that your LinkedIn account is up and good with lots of good stuff current resume upwork the last bullet point under the first main bullet is a lot of freelance work so if you're looking to provide some freelancing skills if you know a certain uh, you know I, I know how to do say for example Facebook ads uh, they're their live video ads that that's kind of my specialty then uh, with the new gig economy sites like upwork can be a place for you to identify career opportunities Glassdoor the fourth bullet point down on the first bullet point is wonderful for um, finding out how much people are getting paid in those current positions so it's self-reported data by people in the field but it does give you an idea for in the San Diego market what are people getting paid for this type of job so look at these sites and they're going to help you get a feel for the job requirements So as I mentioned, you should always have your resume ready to go in a variety of formats. You could have actual hard printed copies as well as ones that are ready to be scanned by the company, like in a PDF format or electronic posting. So uh, the print resume, which I'm old school and I'm still a fan of the printed resume, is um, put on high quality paper, thick paper, ideally. So it's going to stand out and you're either going to mail it to the company or my my preference if it's in San Diego is hand deliver that resume that way you get a foot in the door they get to see who you are you're already talking to the receptionist so I prefer to hand deliver whenever possible if not mail it you don't want to fold it so you want to put it in a large enough envelope so that your resume and cover letter are uh, in an eight, eight and a half by eleven size and not folded scannable resumes that's going to be a PDF a PDF file typically so that and, and it's going to have all your keywords nested within that resume we'll get to that later and then you have electronic postings so that's putting things into LinkedIn and, and monster now remember when you do those electronic postings they're no longer private you're putting them online so be careful about having resumes that include say your home address if uh, you don't want that put out there for uh, the online world The standard parts of a resume are listed here. The identification is your name. Uh, the items two and three there, career objective and career summary, those oftentimes now are just one statement of uh, career objective qualifications, this is your actual skills and experience, uh, and as well as your actual resume background. Again, personal information. So be careful. This is extracurricular stuff like president of, of this club or that club. 
be careful about putting in personal information that can get you screened out of the employer. It is not legal for employers to not hire you because of race, religion, creed, uh, sexual orientation, political affiliation, you name it. It's not legal for them to not hire you because of those affiliations. But in the screening phase where you're submitting your resume and they haven't brought you in for an interview yet, they could screen you out, not as it's a company imperative, but maybe the person who's actually the decision maker is, say, for example, a hardcore liberal, and they only want to hire liberals. And if you had in your resume, um, president of the Cal State San Marcos Student Republicans Club or the Federalist Club, you know, that information is in there, they might screen you out. So be careful about personal information unless you know it's going to play in your favor or that it's neutral in content. Um, how do you know? Well, it's best if you have some exp some intelligence about the company that you're working for. What's the, what's the political climate like at this company? What about the department I'm working in? Try to find out as much as you can about the person and the department that you're going to be interviewing with and hopefully working for. And then that personal information can actually become an asset if it plays in your favor. When in doubt, my recommendation would actually be to leave it out. And then references, those are available upon request. You want to make sure that your references are um, have been signaled and notified that you're interviewing for a job. So keep your references current. When you leave a company that you worked for, you want to get a good reference out of there. It may not be the person you worked for directly, but find somebody that can give you a good reference, a link back to that company. And I always called my references before I interviewed for a new job and told them what the job was that I was interviewing for and if they could stress a certain part of my experience um, to help me get that job, that was always helpful. So again, there's samples of resumes on the week 12 resource page, so please check those out. The most common resume is a chronological resume. That was the example I showed a few slides back where you're listing your current employment and going backwards. So it also lists your education and experience, but it's typically current employment backwards. Now, if you don't have any employment history in the field that you want to be in, then you probably use a functional resume. That says, here's my skills, here's what I, here's my education and training that I have. So that would be for somebody who has very little to no actual work experience. There's a third type that's not listed on this slide, but it's what I would call a combination resume. And that's for somebody who has a fair amount of experience, maybe you know, 15, 20 years in a certain industry and field. So their front page of their resume might be more functional. Here's my skills and experience. And then the second page of that resume would be their actual chronological work experience, current employment backwards. So sometimes you could also have a combo resume for somebody who has more experience. So we go to step three, preparing the resume. And I want to reiterate what I said earlier at the opening of this lecture. So important that you tailor your resume for the specific job that you're going after. Is it maximized for the specific job and company that you're going after? Again, we don't want to falsify information, but sometimes you may want to leave something out. Hey, I had this job only for six months and it wasn't even in the industry I wanted to work for. Do I have to put it in my resume? No, you don't. You can leave that one out. Now, does it have a come with a large job gap? Ugh. Well, then maybe you want to consider, is there something else you can put in there? Were you going to school at that same time? Well, then put in school as what you're doing in place of that short-term job stint. Another good point to add here is item four on, on this slide where it talks about adding a statement of your creativity and originality. You are swimming in a sea of sameness. And that's where a lot of people get the cover letter and resume process wrong, is you're trying to blend in. And when you all blend in, the person who's screening doesn't really see anything that pops for them to bring you in for an interview. So oftentimes, a little creative out-of-the-box approach 
can land you the interview because we want to remember nothing happens until we get the interview. So be willing to risk it and do something a little different to get yourself noticed and hopefully get an interview. Uh, early in my career, I was interviewing for a sales job. It was a direct door-to-door, uh, -door direct sales. And I got an interview and I came in and did the interview and I did horribly in the interview. It was terrible. I went back just more for my own personal pride about a week later and cold called the, and just went in there directly and said, I want to talk to you about an interview. I want to do it right now live. And they wanted to see that type of assertiveness and sales for someone who could go door to door and actually approach people live. And I, I did the interview the second time. I did better. I ended up not taking the job anyways and doing something else. But I kind of had to set the record straight on that one. So another job where I wanted to be out of the box and get an interview early in my career, pretty much right out of college. I had a little bit of marketing experience, but I sent a resume and cover letter in for Pizza Hut when they had a regional marketing job. And I, I liked the food industry. I had experience there and I had a marketing background. I wanted to stay in retail. And so that was an ideal job for me. It was totally out of my experience level. And uh, but I submitted my resume anyways. And what I did was I printed my resume on a large cardboard piece of paper and made it look like a pizza. And I actually got a Pizza Hut pizza and put the resume in the pizza box and FedExed my resume in a pizza box to Pizza Hut. And I think I put like some, you know, uh, some grease stains on the resume and everything to make it more real. And I put that in as part of my cover letter. I got a call from Pizza Hut and they said, wow, you know, nobody's ever sent us their resume in a pizza box before. What a creative and interesting idea. You're totally underqualified for this position, but we would just want to know that we appreciate you uh, being out of the box with how you sent your resume. So Unfortunately, I didn't get an interview because it was way beyond my pay grade and my experience level, but I got noticed. And I can't stress this enough. You have to get to the interview. You have to get to the interview. So you don't want to make stuff up, but you want to get noticed as much as possible. Your resume needs to be strong. It needs to have a lot of keywords that fit the job description that they're going after. But when it comes to your cover letter, here's where you can be a little bit more out of the box and try to get some creativity and have a persuasive uh, cover letter to try to get you to the interview. All right, so many resumes are actually submitted in a, uh, a form that the employer wants you to fill this stuff out. So they don't want to see your, your scanned PDF resume. They want you to actually put stuff in their template. So when we're submitting anything online, their application and attaching the resume, Go slowly and be hyper vigilant to make sure that there's no errors in the content that you're submitting. Zero errors. Errors will get you screened out faster than a New York minute. So don't hurry. When we get in front of our computers, we're used to typing and submitting stuff and we start getting in the applications are long and it's kind of like when you have to submit a new online application just to join some account and submit your credit card and they got all this information. We get in that mode and we start moving fast because we want to complete these forms. When it comes to preparing a resume and submitting it electronically, you don't want to hurry. So you also want to include keywords. We'll talk about keywords in a minute here. Um, and then you also want to have that cover message. So that might be e part of an email attachment. Make sure, most importantly, that you're being hyper vigilant to make sure there's no errors in your electronic submission. And a lot of your resumes are going to be scanned. So oftentimes, who's the first person to see your resume? It's a computer. Uh, a computer will be the first one to see. So they're going to kind of go through and look at all these resumes and try to get down to a short list that maybe then gets to a human being who then screens it even further and gets down to an even shorter list that eventually gets to the hiring person who interviews maybe three or four people. Scannable resumes, there's a great example on page 259 of the textbook. Typically, they're going to, uh, a PDF usually works. Uh, there's also some app, apps that you can put on your phone for scanning stuff, such as TurboScan. There's others. 
if they want you to scan your actual hard copy of your resume. But usually they're going to ask you to submit a PDF. Um, and you also want to have make sure that you have a lot of the keywords that are part of the job description in your resume because they'll be scanning and, and pulling out those keywords to see if you're a, an appropriate candidate. So let's talk about those. So when we talk about keywords, first off, you want your name on the resume on each page so they can they can keep all your stuff together. You can put it in the header of your resume as well as your your, intro, your information up front. But if you have your resume covered with a header that has your name on it, then it makes sure that that comes up when they're scanning for you. Uh, keywords, uh, oftentimes in online world, they might ask you for a keyword summary. Uh, tell us, tell us your your, your key, uh, why we should hire you, and list a few of the keywords that describe you. Then that would be where your keyword summary goes in, and you want those the most important keywords first in that list, and the least important last. And most importantly, you want to match the keywords as they are listed exactly in the job description. If the job description says um, computer assisted design, then you want to write computer assisted design in the keywords and not CAD, C-A-D. So make sure the keywords match exactly. You want the uh, first letter of each keyword capitalized. So computer assisted design, the C would be capitalized. Uh, you can put a period at the end of each one to separate it so they know that it's a new keyword. And then not only in that keyword summary, but actually in your resume, when you're talking about your skills and accomplishments and anywhere in the resume where you can list either jobs that match the keywords as far as skills and accomplishments underneath each job that you had, uh, try to match those up as much as possible with the keywords that are listed. So those go in what we call the resume body, which is not the summary up front electronically, but the actual body of the resume itself. Keywords matter. Match the job descriptions for your keywords. Employers might also want some supplemental information. Step four, supplementing a resume. So they might want to see a portfolio of your work. Certainly if you're a freelancer, uh, that helps. When I was uh, in the advertising agency business, I had a portfolio of here's uh, all the printed materials that I used to work on. Here's some commercials that I, that I produced. They want to see that stuff. So you may want to start keeping a portfolio of your work. The employer might also ask you for an employment video, a video resume, if you will, which is just a short introduction of yourself to the company. And we'll talk about how to shoot that correctly. When I interviewed for my job here at Miracosta, I included testimonials from students who had completed my business communication course and they were providing feedback. And I put all those on YouTube and sent them to Miracosta as part of my supplemental information as part of my resume submission. And they liked it and that helped get me an interview. So if you do have to shoot an employment video, now you're doing webcam world, just like I'm doing with you right now, and you want to be aware of your surroundings, things like your sound, the lighting. I can see that the lighting here is putting a glare on my, on my glasses a little bit. Um, you want to be aware of what's in your background, so there's nothing that's offensive in the background. And you want to speak clearly and at a good pace, have a good microphone. So set all that up before you actually shoot this video. Make sure you're looking good. Um, but not too good, <laughs> nothing, nothing excessively revealing. Um, and keep the video simple and relatively short, two to four minutes top. Then step five, the cover letter or what we call the application message. This is the message that accompanies and introduces your resume. I call it a cover letter because that's typically what it's called is a cover letter. So it may not actually be a letter. It might be in an email that accompanies, you know, attaching the PDF. But you still want to treat it as if it's a cover letter as far as content. What is a cover letter? It's a persuasive message. You're trying to get the interest of the employer that they should not only read your resume, but they should also bring you in for an interview. If they bring you in for an interview, remember this. There's a lot of applicants that have the experience and training that they're after. So in that regard, you're not unique as far as the resume that you're submitting. 
what they want to know is are you interesting do we want you on our team are we going to like you maybe even do you have a sense of humor so they want to bring you in for the interview to find out some of these things but you can also display some of these components in your cover letter through creativity through uh, an attention getting opener in your cover letter so don't be afraid to take some risks with your cover letter because it might get you noticed to the point where you actually get an interview and you don't have an interview yet so you really have nothing to lose you don't want to be offensive but you want to try to write a cover letter that's going to get the attention of the person reading your resume and application information and get you an interview. So you can see some examples on page 263 and 269. I think they're okay. I always like to open my cover letter with a question, something about, are you looking for somebody with XYZ experience? And then boom, I believe I'm the person you're looking for. And then my subsequent paragraphs would talk about my experience that fits exactly the job experience that are part of their, their job description. And then I always closed with something assertive, but not pushy, something to the effect of, listen for your phone. I'll be calling you next week to see if we can schedule time for an interview, as opposed to, thank you for taking the time to review my resume. I look forward to the opportunity to speak with you about this opportunity. So you're waiting for them to make the first move. Make the first move yourself. Um, say that you're going to call them next week, and that gives you you've already, that gives you the approval to call next week and, and follow up again. So don't be afraid to, to stand out a little bit. Hand deliver your cover letter and resume to the organization. That's another way. Be prepared if you do that. If you walk in there, they might actually talk to the person that you're going to interview with. So have your unique selling point going back to those earlier slides of who you are and be prepared to have a short conversation in the lobby. Sometimes they might actually do that. General writing guidelines. You want to be careful as you craft your resume. The advice I always give students is Focus on your accomplishments. Use accomplishment-based language. Did you manage people? How many? Did you help increase sales? How much? So have quant quantified accomplishments um, that you've considered. Even if you're just a, a receptionist or somebody who dealt with customers on a frontline position, handled an average of 50 customer interactions a day, right? So put it in numbers and make it quantifiable, not something like answered phones, right? That's, that's talking about your job duties. You wanna focus on your accomplishments. You understand the difference? So look at your job duties and flip them into accomplishments-based language. There's some good uh, accomplishment-based words in the text for reference. So don't be too much about I, I did this and I did that. So that's writer focus statements. And you don't want these unconvincing generalizations like, I love to work with customers. So customer service is my life, right? Where it's a little bit an unconvincing uh, overgeneralization. So have some specifics. Provide the information that they want, that they're asking for in your cover letter. And show that you have some knowledge about the company the, the job requirements. So show that you've done some homework, you know, in visiting your stores. I believe that my experience in uh, makes me an excellent candidate for this position. Um, focus on your strengths and have a positive attitude in your clothes. All right, so here's an example of a quote cover letter. This is actually an email. So let's just call it an application message. But this is the introduction of yourself with the intent of trying to get the interviewer's attention. Look at your resume and get me an interview. So let's evaluate how this message did. I'm going to ask you to pause the video for a second, read this message, and then we'll uh, top line review how they did. Take a minute now to pause the video and read. 
Okay, so there's a lot of things to like about this, this cover message. So first of all, the subject line is rich and informative. It's, inform it's not just a resume attached, it's letting them know that, hey, we talked at this career fair and I'm following up with my resume. So a rich and informative subject line because that's the first thing people see in their inbox. Also a mention to how the applicant found the job. So Brandon is talking about how they met at the career fair and you'll see in the uh, closing paragraph that they also mentioned that you requested that they submit uh, the resume. So that's good stuff. Um, and he asked for the next step. Please message me so we can discuss my joining tropical importers. I think that's OK as a, as a close. I always like to listen for your phone. I'll be calling you next week to see if we can schedule time for an interview. You can reach me at. So this actually has a problem in that in the closing he doesn't provide his contact information, which at the minimum should be your email and phone information. So you always want to put that in the close of your cover. Don't make them go, oh, it's on my resume. Well, now they have to go pull up your resume and find it there, right? So make it painless for the potential hirer to contact you. So don't turn them to your resume. Don't give them a chore. Give them everything they need to contact you. So I give this one an average score, uh, good up until the closing, and then it could be more specific on the contact information. Okay, my friends, that was a lot of material. Thanks for sticking through this lecture. So in summary, resumes, they are important as our cover letters. So it's the first thing that people look at. Oftentimes it's a computer that looks at your resume first. So you want to make it clean and perfect with keywords. We want to know how to find those jobs. There's those online job posting sites, but there's also good old fashioned networking and getting a foot in the door with internships or trade organizations or knowing somebody in the company. So tons of electronic sources now. That's your third bullet point here. And fourth bullet point, you might need some supplemental stuff like videos. So make sure that those are shot professionally if you have that request from the employer. And then of course, there's always an application message, what I call a cover letter, um, that's gonna introduce the resume. And that's a chance for you to really stand out, be a little creative, get out of the sea of sameness of all the applicants, maybe hand deliver it, and write a catchy, engaging cover letter that's gonna get the attention of the reader and hopefully get you to an interview. Be willing to take some risks with the cover letter. That's it, my friends. Good luck with your assignment this week. And I hope you send it to an actual employer. Who knows what happens? They're going to hire somebody. Why not you? Best of luck. Email me if you have any questions. Bye-bye.